And as always, this episode is sponsored by my go-to stop for anything makeup, Revlon. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to the incomparable Scooter Braun. Scooter is one of the most incredible music managers in the world. You know him for bringing us Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, and countless other amazing musicians. Hi, Scooter Braun. Hi. <laughs> you're We're on, here. You're a pretty big deal. Oh, this is exciting. I remember when you came up with the idea. What a lot of people don't know is that um, not only do I know you, but you and Penny are business partners, management team, and it's only been like, what, two years now? Maybe. Yes. Yeah, not, not even. even. Not even, I don't even think. No, I don't think so either. We've had a really good run. We have. And you had me over to your house, actually, before I officially signed on the dotted line. And it was so nice because I walked in and your house is gorgeous. Your wife, Yale, is so beautiful and hospitable. You've got three gorgeous kids. And I want to talk to you about the importance of family. Yeah, I mean, and look, congratulations again. Thank you. Because you guys are starting your family. Yes. And there's just nothing more important because I think we all kind of, you know, are a little bit damaged. I actually grew up in a really stable, warm household. And I think even, you know, you get damaged somehow. You know, everyone's dealing with their stuff. And then when you get older, you look for validation to kind of handle that damage. Mm. And then some of us are lucky enough to have what society considers success. Mm. And you might get fame, you might get monetary success, you might get the attention you've been looking for, but it doesn't actually validate you in the way you want. And then you see these people who have success having sadness and kind of depression because they're a little bit lost of what it actually looks like. But I found that people who have a foundation of family, whether it be the family they make with their friends, the family they start, or the family they already had, they're able to sustain a lot better because that's what really matters. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. When did you figure all of that out? I thought I knew it. You know, I knew how to say all the right things because I grew up with a good family. I don't think I actually figured it out until I met my wife, Yale. Oh. No, it's, it's honest because I was... You know, there was my insecurities. I was having a lot of success and I was looking for, you know, what validated me. And then when I met her, I realized, you know, between her and the kids, I don't, I don't need that validation anywhere anymore. I can just do good work and I can try and be kind to people. Other people's issues are not my issue. I can only control my own actions. But she kind of gave me that comfort that I'm enough, you mm. know, and that in that home, I'm enough. And then when I come home, and I think my issues at work or whatever I'm dealing with is such a huge problem. I come home and I realize they're just an inconvenience. They're not a problem because when my kid says, daddy, play with me, they don't care about who I am out there. Right. They just want daddy. Right. And I'm actually really excited for you to get the mommy come I play know. with me because you're going to understand that all this stuff that stressed you out in the past, it doesn't matter. I'm so excited for that. And I, I, I need some scooter advice. Well, I would give advice to different people, but I know what advice I'd give to you. You and I share ambition. This thing that I've just come to terms with, and I know you're, how you are, you're going to be the same way. You're never going to be able to turn it off. Mm -hmm. When the kids come, like I said, you always know the right thing to say. I know the right thing to say. Um, but there's going to be a struggle, which I used to wrestle with, and actually someone gave me amazing advice, where my true biggest fear was this idea of balance. How do I balance what I know is real inside of me, which is my never-ending ambition, versus being a good father and a good husband. Mm. Because even though I, I, I am a good father, a good husband, I know I could be better, but sometimes I choose ambition. And I used to think I gotta figure out balance, I gotta figure out balance. And that's gonna be a struggle for you because you're gonna meet your beautiful child and you might have more children in the future and you're gonna wanna be the greatest mom of all time and the greatest wife of all time, but you still have built this thing to this point of Ashley Graham and you want, I know your dreams, like you're not gonna give up on them. Mm -mm. And someone gave me really great advice because I told them that was a fear of mine. And they said, you're using a word I hate. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, uh, I hate the word balance. <gasps> Interesting. And he changed my life with this advice. He said, this, this word balance means you're weighing something against something else. Mm. And he goes, you should never have to weigh your ambition versus your family. He goes, it just, it isn't make sense for you to have to weigh your dreams 
versus being a part of your family. He goes, I want you to change the word in your head to harmonize. He was like, because if you're at work and you go home and something's wrong at work, you can't give your children the proper attention. And if you go to work and something's wrong with your children, you can't give work the proper attention. But if you're able to harmonize them and bring them together and make your family a fabric in everything that you do so that your kids are going to grow up being proud of what you do, understanding what you do, understanding your frustrations, rooting for you the same way, seeing your work ethic and, and wanting to be a part of it, and vice versa, everyone at work knows that your family is a part of who you are and they are welcome in everything that you guys do, then you harmonize the two and they don't have to balance off each other. And, and it's also a stress relief, you know, yeah. to take the word balance out of everything and just say, okay, no, everything is gonna harmonize around me. It just feels lighter. It feels lighter. It, that simple changing of the word in your brain mm -hmm. makes it make sense in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other side is when you, you talk about it feels lighter. What are we doing this for? It's for, you know, quality of life. And You've kind of, said this to me. Yeah. You said, you said, what are we doing this for? Why am I working so hard? I'm going to go play with my kids. It's just that simple. Well, if I called you tomorrow and I said, Ashley, I need to meet you to meet with the CEO of a major corporation. I know you, you're going to prioritize. Yeah. You're going to kill the meeting. You're Hell gonna yeah. go, why are we not prioritizing our kids the same way? This is true. So you should put it in your schedule. <gasps> this is good. You should put it in your schedule. Like literally, when you have your child, tell your assistant, whoever, put in my schedule this time, like a CEO meeting. Why should someone be able to call? If they call you and you're with a CEO, are they gonna, they'll take, your assistant will take a message and they're gonna say she's behind closed doors in an important meeting. Why shouldn't your kids have that same attention? Oh my gosh, major mental note. In still talking about family and, you know, we've been able to discuss this a little bit because it's a big part of your story is about your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I want the PBD listeners to know about that and where you've really come from. So my grandparents on my dad's side, I was really, really close with. I'm close with both my grandparents. My mom's died, her dad died when she was 11, uh, pretty suddenly, and my step-grandfather raised me on that side and um, my grandmother and they're great people. My dad's side had a huge effect on me because my grandmother um, was uh, 14 years old when she went into Auschwitz um, and she was liberated a year and a half later in Bergen-Belsen um, and my grandfather was in Dachau. So they actually met after the, the war and the Holocaust but they were survivors of the camps. Wow. And then they went back to Hungary, met each other, had two kids and then escaped during the Hungarian revolution in 1956. Wow. And my dad's a refugee in the United States. Knowing their story, knowing what we come from, knowing that my grandmother literally saw the worst of humanity on a daily basis. She used to run in a circle every morning naked while Dr. Mengele decided who lived and who died. Oh and she still was the, you know, she died almost three years ago now. Anyone who met her will tell you she was the light of every room she walked into. Aww. Everyone loved Ma, that's what we called her. She was just a very special person. My grandfather died when I was 14 and he was, he was the strongest man I ever met. And they were just really remarkable people. You know, my grandmother died, my oldest son got to meet her. And my youngest son was born nine days after she passed. Wow. My daughter obviously never got to meet her. I wasn't sad that she left me. I was sad because she already gave me everything I needed. Mm -hmm. I was sad because if they would have got to know her the way I did mm -hmm. and love her the way I did and understand that this woman survived the Holocaust, came here as a refugee, worked in a sweatshop 18 years in the city while my dad grew up, they would have loved her the way I did and mm -hmm. respected everyone because that was the gift. So like when I go out places and I see people doing an odd job, or you know, struggling in their nine to five or whatever the situation that might be, I know that they're someone's hero the way they were my hero. Mm -hmm. And everybody deserves that respect. And as my kids kind of grow up in this extraordinary lifestyle because of what's happened to me and my wife, I wanna make sure they never lose that. Mm -hmm. So um, you've seen the movie Coco? I don't think so. Okay, you're gonna see a lot of kids' movies when you have this child. <laughs> um, I do love like a Pixar or a Disney. Oh, then you have to see Coco. Okay. I'm giving a lot of props to Coco here, but this is this is a must see. Why? Coco is this really great Disney Pixar film. It's basically about this kid in, in Mexico who the day of the dead comes. Oh, I saw it. It's great. Yeah, I saw it on the airplane. They have all these pictures of the family members for the day of the dead. Okay. And every year for the day of the dead, they come to this table and they tell the stories of those lost. And what happens is in, the, in, in this world, they disappear when no one remembers them. So you need family to remember you. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really beautiful tradition. So by my front door, there's this table. And when you leave it, there's now pictures of family members who have passed, including my grandmother. And every day before my kids go to school, as they walk by, they say, bye, ma. 
Aww. And they say goodbye to the picture, and, and my son knows he has her green eyes. Aww. And like I, I, you know, promised her when she died, they would never forget her. They would know her. Yeah. And that movie helped give me a tool to do that. That's really beautiful. It's good. I think it for kids to know where they came from gives them a sense of pride and um, and confidence. I agree. I'm glad that my son will be able to know where he comes from. And it'll be about his grandparents also being so involved in his life. But just switching gears a little bit, still kind of on family. Okay. You know, you, you had a little rebellious side to you. You were out there um, selling fake IDs. Oh. Are you looking for water? No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying there's like statute of limitations. How many years have we been here? Like, am I, I think I'm okay. Did your parents know what no. you were doing? They had no idea? <laughs> no. I, I Look, I played, um, I'm not the biggest guy, but I played basketball competitively growing up. I had an opportunity to go to college to play basketball. And when I got to school, my one of my best friends was Jay Williams, who was playing at Duke. Um, and he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and definitely, you know, a future NBA star. And, That's cool. And everyone was so excited about his games. And I'm like, no one cares about my games. <laughs> and uh, I, I also didn't like being broke. Mm. And I never, my dad never gave me a credit card my whole life. Like, he just was like, get a job. You know, you, I, as long as you're in our house, I'll put food on the table, but you leave this property, figure it out. The kids I went to school with had a different situation. A lot of them had credit cards and they were like, let's go to the clubs and, you know, I'm buying this. And I didn't like being broke. So um, my buddy sold fake IDs and I said, your business plan sucks. <laughs> I was like, you're going to get caught. So I, I basically showed him how to make a better business plan, how to push these fake New York IDs. And um, how much were you making per ID? A lot of money. <laughs> margins, Couple grand? Margins were great. I'm just, Got it. <laughs> and Got it. Uh, we made a lot of money for a freshman in college very quickly, a lot of money. And uh, I had, I won't go into details, but I had a way of doing it um, that was very uh, lucrative, where we would, there was something called AirTran. Do you remember what that was? Mm mm. So this is pre-9-11. There was an airline out of Atlanta called AirTran that flew all over the country, basically where Delta flew. And as long as you had a student ID, you could fly anywhere AirTran flew for $49 if there was an open seat. Whoa. Like you just show up and get on for $49 pre-9-11. We used to fly to state schools <laughs> and for one weekend go in. Oh, and, snap. You made this global or you I, made this like nationwide? I, well, my thing is like we do it on our own campus. You shit in your backyard. You smell <laughs> the shit. Like... So I, I was like, we got to go. So we would fly to state schools away from our school, use fake names, blanket it in two days. It didn't matter if there were more orders or not. We were out of there. And I said, you can't keep in touch with people. And he broke my rule, kept in touch with someone. So I said, I'm done. And so I did it for like two months and then stopped. Had some good money. And then I walked by a nightclub and asked the guy, hey, would you give me money if I brought people? And he said, yes. And that started my path as a party promoter. Wow. I mean, you can't, you kind of can't knock it because it's like where you are today. But if one of your little boys grew up and started doing that now, what would you say? I did a lot of things. Looking back now as a father, I understand my dad's frustration mm. because my dad grew up in Queens, was a refugee, grew up in an immigrant neighborhood. And his parents were super protective. And like all they wanted to do was get him out of the neighborhood, get him a good life. And then he works really hard and moves us to the suburbs where I can go to a really good public school and have a really good life. And then suddenly I go down to college, call myself Scooter, tell everyone I'm from Queens because I'm too embarrassed to say that I'm the first one to be living out in the suburbs. <laughs> and this punk 18, 19 year old goes in and just like gets in the streets of Atlanta, like heavy. And I saw a lot of crazy stuff and I experienced uh, things that I would never want my child to witness. And uh, I now understand why my dad was so upset. And I look back and it's not like, I think sometimes as a guy, you try to flex and you know, feel your bravado and everything. And, and I don't really look at it that way. I look at, I was young and stupid. Mm. And I didn't need to put myself in any of those positions. Mm. And I'm very blessed and lucky that I didn't get caught up mm -hmm. you know, with the wrong stuff. I, n I never sold drugs or anything, but I was around stuff I shouldn't have been around. Mm -hmm. And um, I got very lucky that my life is where it is today and, and I, I'd rather just sit with my kid and honestly tell him the stories right. and be like, don't do this. Learn from my mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. But you talk a lot about your dad and I, I want to talk about your mom Okay. because I feel like she's the rock of the family. She is. And, and I want to hear more about, you know, I'm growing a little boy inside of me and I want to hear about that mother-son bond. My mom's the moral compass of our family. 
Oh, wow. You, you hope each generation is better than the one before. And I tell my dad all the time, I'm better than you because she was my mother. That's she, great. <laughs> that's the truth. My mom had me when she was in school to be an orthodontist. Mm. And she wasn't planning on having me. I was a pleasant surprise, as she calls it. And she actually- Where do you rank in kids? I'm the oldest. Okay. She actually walked to her graduation nine months pregnant with me. My mom was one of the first female orthodontists in the country to have her own private practice. She always raised us with this respect. And it was very strange because like, as you know, my family is, uh, whether it be Holocaust survivors, I have two adopted brothers. Not everyone in my family is the same color. And I also grew up in a household where my mom and dad were completely equal. Mm. They both were working. They both like were there for us at every single event together. They both, like they were superheroes. And I never saw it as my dad or my mom. I saw it as a unit and I saw it as equal. Wow. And my dad was loud, but when my mom put her foot down, that was it. That was it. And my mom wasn't afraid to argue with my dad. Like I was raised by a strong woman. So I always wanted to be with a strong woman. Oh, Yale is a strong woman. Sometimes we look for what we, what we saw. Justin's mom and I are crazy similar. There you go. There and, you go. <laughs> and and it, you know, it's funny because she's really remarkable because she doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember one year, and this is something I've never talked about because it's something more ashamed of, but I can talk about it years later. We had like a sold out, you know, show or somewhere like a big show. And it was a lot of stress. I was really excited and show happens. And I'm like, we pulled it off. And I think we were filming it or something for a movie. I don't even remember what it was. And the next day I realized my mom's birthday was yesterday and I forgot, I didn't call her or I even spoke to her, but didn't mention it. And I call her up and I'm so apologetic. And my mom goes, don't even worry about it. What made me happy on my birthday was knowing that you were succeeding and you were happy. Aww. And the luckiest thing for me in my life is that I was raised by someone that selfless. Yeah. She really just cares for us. And I think only a mother can have that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm trying to be the best dad I could possibly be, but I realized I was a dad the day Jagger came out. Yeah. You guys feel every little thing. The kicks, the kicks make it real. Yeah, you, you're making well, life. And the weight. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... Look, you guys keep them alive. You know, it, there's do our this, best. Yeah, I, I, I fell more in love with my wife watching her keep my children alive because my kids want nothing to do with me. They were like, come here, life source. <laughs> you, I don't need. Um, but it's, my mom, she doesn't get enough credit. Uh, I haven't spoke about her enough and I don't know why. Mama Braun. Yeah, she's, my mom's really, really special. And here's, here's someone who lost her father very suddenly when she was 11. Mm. And they did not come from a wealthy family. And at the time he was the breadwinner. Wow. You know, and my mom decided very early on, I'm never going to be in a situation where if I lose my husband, I cannot provide for my family. Mm. And that is why my mom became a professional. I really admire her. She's just a very, very special, special person. Well, it's good. I mean, she's kind of probably been a major catalyst, not only with your marriage to Yale, but also with all the powerful women that work at SBP. It just goes to show how you do um, put strong, powerful women in great lights. You know, it's funny. Someone said to me, all our parents imprint on us, whether it's good or bad, they imprint. And if my dad's watching this, he'll laugh and my mom will love this. But, you know, 80% of our company is women. It's like, That's awesome. and our senior you know, team is majority women. I'd laugh because I probably trust my mom a little bit more than I trust my dad. And I might've spilled over into the workplace. <laughs> um, but my dad, dad, that's a joke. It's fine. It, you can deal with it. Um, mom loves it. But uh, my mom, she wants to believe in the goodness in everything. Mm. And it took me a long time to figure out that's a better way to live. And uh, I'm just very like, she's an amazing grandmother now. And yeah, I'm just very, very lucky to have her. To get into work a little bit. so. You know, we've all heard the I Love College with Asher Roth story and then how you then found Justin Bieber. But you pushed through so much rejection in the beginning. There's nothing that ever turned into something major in my life that people were like, do it. It's great. You should, everything that ever turned into something major was something someone told me not to do. But so who were some of the like un, unsung heroes that really helped you in the beginning? One was just Justin and his mother taking the chance. Mm. Uh, another one was a guy named Tom Boyd, who's Asher's friend who actually picked up the phone and hung up with me the first time thinking I was the cops trying to cancel their party. <laughs> How old were you at this time? Uh, 25. There are guys like Shaka Zulu, who manages Ludacris, who really looked out for me, him and his brother Jeff Dix in the beginning of my career. 
uh, there was a guy, rest in peace, Shakir Stewart, who was one of the first mentors I had in Atlanta. Wow. Um, Jermaine Dupree gave me a job as the vice president of Soso Def when I was 20 years old because um, he saw me in the party scene in Atlanta and thought that I had more potential than just being a, you know, in the party scene. There's a lot of people along the way who I kind of stood on their shoulders to get to where I needed to go to. You know, I don't think anyone does this alone. You know, they're just people who took chances and risks. The smallest little thing, a blog that was killing it, that I said, would you please put this artist up? And they looked out. There are people who were just kind. Mm. You know, it's funny that when you're starting, you remember the people who don't need to be kind, who are kind. Don't even do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they just happen to work at the company that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And you're in the hallway and they actually notice your breathing, mm. you know, and they choose to be kind. I never actually, some of these people I never did work with. I just would see them all the time. And they were always nice to me when they didn't need to be. Mm -hmm. And then years later, when my life's changed, those are the ones I want to reciprocate. Those are the ones like, oh, you need help? Yeah, we didn't do anything together, but you actually did do something. You made me feel valued when you didn't need to. Kindness goes so far. Completely. That's why I talked about my grandparents earlier. You never know who somebody is. Or like when I met my wife, she actually tweeted something that made me want to meet her. That's how I asked my friend John Chu, please introduce me to her. It was a quote by Plato, be kind for everyone who fights a hard battle. Wow. And you don't know what people are going through. And if you can just be kind, it, it, goes, a it goes a really long way. And you never know who you're being kind to and when that karma will come back around. If you know me, you know I'm all about that self care and one of my new favorite self-care routines is all about scents. Vitruvi is a family company committed to creating chic essential oil products that help women take care of themselves so they can take care of the world. Vitruvi aromas are made from 100% pure plant-based essential oils making this safe for you and your family to breathe in on a daily basis and it can help you set the mood whether you need a moment of calm, a deep sleep, or a boost of energy. Head to vitruvi.com slash pretty big deal for a look at special offers and get 20% off with code PBD. All right, now back to pretty big deal. Was there any fear when you realized how big this was actually going to be? When I saw him singing So Sick by Neo on YouTube, that was like one of the six videos that were up, I knew what I could do with this. I, like I saw the whole thing play out. Wow. Until he was 18. I didn't know where we'd go at 18. I wasn't ready for that. But... You know, it's all, <laughs> but and, and, and all, it's all great now, and I'm really proud of the man he is today and yeah. where he is with Haley and how happy he is and yeah. grounded he is for everything They're he's been so through. They're so sweet. I mean, 7 billion people on the planet, billions before us, no one's ever grown up like him. Yeah. No one's ever grown up the most Googled person on the planet their entire adolescence in a world of social media. Yeah. So I credit him for where he is today. Um, but I saw it pretty instantly, and I, I was like Bieber fever patient zero. Like, I was in. My dad used to say to us when we were growing up, Everyone takes a shit on the toilet just like you. Hey. So don't be intimidated. For real. And so whenever I'd go in a situation where I was slightly intimidated, I would actually visualize <laughs> that person <laughs> on the toilet struggling through a shit. My parents always taught me, why not you? Mm. You know, like, why not you? And everyone's equal. Mm. You know, everyone's equal in this world. Why not you? You know where your grandparents came from, everything else. So I feel like every situation I went in, I thought, well, why not? In my dorm room, I read a book that changed my life about David Geffen. A book that he's, you know, we don't have to go into that, but he's remarkable. And One was, of your mentors. Yeah, now he's become, in my 30s, I met him and he actually lived up to everything I dreamed and he became someone I'm very close with. I love him to death. The thing that made me believe in myself when I was reading that book and learning his story wasn't that he was perfect. It was that he was flawed. Mm. Because he was flawed, it made me believe that I could do it because I know I'm flawed. Mm. And I think that's something I've really been working on sharing because it's taken me a long time to get to this place. Mm -hmm. That vulnerability is strength. And I actually not only can give myself comfort, but I can help more people by telling them with everything that's happened in my life, I'm still figuring it out. I'm still broken. I'm still scared at times. That's not only okay, that's normal. I want to talk about your vulnerability because you have become so open about it, but I want to get to it because mm -hmm. I feel like there's so much buildup to where you are now. And just getting back to Justin a little bit, what has it been like having a relationship with someone like him and seeing them now and living this out? Yeah, I was, I was talking to uh, someone, his name is Alfredo Flores. And Alfredo was on the road with me and Justin for years as Justin's videographer. And actually, he's now on the road with Ariana. Mm. And we were talking about how it's become too normal for us. Mm. That you get, I wouldn't say jaded, but like you don't realize 
you know, one concert, you bring someone backstage and they're not a part of that element. They're like, holy. But when you're doing sold out shows all around the world, multiple artists, and it becomes something pretty phenomenal, I still see Justin. I don't see Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. I don't see Ariana Grande. You see Ariana? I see Ariana. Like, I, I see them as humans. And because I've been there from the start and I've seen them at their worst, I've seen them at their best. They've seen me at my worst mm -hmm. and seen me at my best. And you become family with these people. And you, you are not naive. You know that at one point things might not work out, everything else. But for the time you are together, you're grateful. And we have no intention of going separate ways, all these people I get to work with. It's wild when I see people reacting in a certain way because I, I don't see them in that light. You know, and I get protective like family sometimes because in today's world where all you need is an audience to say whatever you want, there's no accountability anymore. You can literally make up your story and say whatever facts you want. When people talk about them and have no grasp of the truth and they're, right. they're stripping together their conspiracy theories, we all get 140 characters at the same time. So the person with credibility has the same size, you know, as the person who lies every single day. Mm -hmm. I get very protective because I want to fight for them. But what I've realized now after all these years, the best thing we can do is instead of fighting on their behalf and not and answering everything, is just look them in the eye and say, don't even worry about that. We know our truth. Let's keep rocking. Mm. The storm has come. There's nothing to respond. The storm will pass. The truth always comes out in the long run. Let's show with our actions. Have you felt the need to overcompensate in order to gain respect, especially being such a young player in such a big world? Uh, for a long time, yes. Not now. Because um, uh, now you're Scooter Brown. No, because David, I, I David say, Geffen gave me good advice. Oh, what did he say? He called me on my BS and taught me an important lesson. Break it down for us. I was at a, a lunch uh, with him and another person who, you know, like success is relative, but this person is in the world of finance, one of the biggest in the world. Okay. They asked me a question. And the question was kind of demeaning of like, who are you kind of thing. I responded kind of a little confused. And then they responded another way that was also a little bit demeaning because they had no idea who I was. And I felt a need in that moment to buck up, mm. you know, chest out a little bit and like, let them know who I am. Exactly. And when the lunch is over, this guy actually later came back to me and was like, hey, apologize, didn't realize, you know, love to learn more. And was like kind of apologetic because he was a little bit rude at the time. Okay. But David said to me after lunch, he goes, hey, Scooter, can I talk to you? And he pulled me aside and he goes, don't do that. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you felt a need to tell him who you were because you felt disrespected. Your ego won. Your Ooh. insecurity won. Ooh. You have nothing to prove. And when you do that, you actually look less than, because why are you having to say this? And I realized the only time I've ever let my ego win is when I'm insecure. You know, when I'm, when I'm nervous, when I don't feel respected. And that's not on me. Mm. And I kind of realized I got to let go of that. Because I know as soon as it happens, I'm like, damn, I wish I didn't say that. I'm wishing it buck up or I should not put my chest down. And, you know, it took getting called out by someone I respect to basically take a look at myself and say, why do you do that? You do it not because you deserve to be respected. You do it because you're insecure in yourself. Mm -hmm. And some, you have some kind of need to feel wanted. And I was like, I don't need that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I know my truth. I have Yale. I have the kids. I have my friends. Like, I don't need to prove something to someone I don't know. Because if I do that, I'll be chasing that my whole life. But sometimes we don't even, we're not even able to hear that kind of advice unless if it is from someone that we admire. 100%. And by the way, there's a high likelihood I'll make the mistake again. Right. We're human. A hundred percent. But next time I'll learn faster and each time I'll get better and better. And I've gotten a lot better from it, from that advice. Mm -hmm. But there, I'm sure there'll be some moment in the future where I just feel super disrespected. But now it's kind of flipped. Now my favorite thing in the world, I don't go out. You know this. I don't leave my house. I know. <laughs> now that I have kids and my wife, like, I just love being home. Aww. But if I'm like on the road and someone's like, meet me out for a drink or like meet me at this club, nothing makes me happier than going to like some cool club and walking up to the door and the doorman not knowing who I am and just holding me there and giving <laughs> me that refuse to speak to me moment. And I just, I just love it. I just sit there and I just take it in. And people are like looking at me, they're like, you want me to tell him and you'll you get, and, and I'm, I'll probably, like, okay. I'm like friends with the owner of the place or something. Right. Like I've known for 15 years and, and they'll be looking at me and I'll be like, no, I'm actually 
good. <laughs> I'm securing myself. I'm really enjoying this moment. Uh, and it's the truth is because that that isn't validation. Your validation is your friends and your family. Yeah. You are undoubtedly one of the top people in the music industry right now. And I want to know who you're most excited about. So I'll answer in an interesting way. I got asked this question last year and I actually said Billie Eilish and her were okay. like my two that I was like, not mine. Love. Love these artists. I'm excited to see what Lizzo does next. Same. Because um, I think she's had this album out for two years and she's having her moment. But I'm sure she's like ready to do something else too. And she's so phenomenal. She really is. That I'm excited to see what happens next. People that I'm excited that you're managing right now are Demi Lovato and Jay Balvin. Well, it's funny you say that. So Jay Balvin's next album is phenomenal. And so is hers. Oh, really? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I would like she's to say. The mo she's the most honest she's ever been. Thank God. I am so excited to see her honesty like come out through something that she does so well. I'm not saying that she's never been honest, but just, just to know what Demi's been through, through the public perception, to hear in her words is going to be unreal. And she's doing it that way. And I, I just told her, I was like, look, there is no judgment here. This is health, happiness, most important thing. We had this conversation and I think she, she knows she's completely safe to do whatever she wants and it's vulnerable and amazing. I'm excited to, to see Demi thrive. Oh, I'm you, such a Demi fan. When I said no to Demi? Yeah. I met her, she was remarkable. I said yes. You said no first one I was time? Like, I was like, I'm gonna say, no, when I met her, I, st I stopped saying no. I was like, okay, I'm gonna meet with her. Oh, people I'm, called, will you take her? No, and then I you said, met her in person, you said I yes. I said, I'll take the meeting, but I'm not gonna do this. We have too much going on. And I met her and I said, I have to do this. She's special. I want to do it. And she told me she was meeting with no one else. She's like, I want it to be you. I told her I need to speak to the two big solo females that we represent because I want to make sure that they're okay with this. And who are they? Tori Kelly and Ariana Grande. Okay. Huge vocalists, both of them. And Demi's a big vocalist. So Tori was no problem, no issue, not, you know, not in my lane right now. And Ariana is this huge pop superstar. And they knew each other. So uh, Demi, I said, you should talk to her to make sure she's okay. Demi and Ariana went for coffee. And Ariana called me and said, you have to do this. I want her with us. You know, she, like if she's in our family, I know she's, she'll be protected. She's my friend. I want her with us. I want you to help her. And I just thought that was really, really cool and very different from what you expect in today's music industry. We did a listening party with Demi of some of the songs with Ariana. Ariana was giving notes and saying how excited she is. And it's just, it's really, really nice when and everyone's encouraging each other. In fact, I was with Jay Balvin last night and Ariana FaceTimed me and they were talking and talking about their experiences on the road. And it's just, we're trying to create this kind of family. Justin and Ariana talk all the time. Wow. So it's, it's just very, very nice to see people being supportive. And it's a camaraderie. 100%. I mean, when I walk into the SVP offices, I feel it right away. I mean, it's just, it's mad love. Let's talk about Instagram because it is, it's such a tool. You get love and you get criticism. And I want to talk about how you handle it. Criticism of my industry for being public. Whew. That's what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, because you get it. Yeah. You get it a lot. Yeah. Tell me how you handle it. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, my thing is very simple. I know my truth. When I was in Atlanta, there was a manager who managed a humongous act. Huge act. Winning Grammys, everything. And then the following year, that act broke up. And it was like no one cared about the manager. And even if he had another act that he wanted to support, it just, no one would pick up his phone call because his destiny was determined by this mm. act's decision whether they're gonna work or not. Hmm. And I just decided that I'm going to build my acts and support them as best I can, but I'm also going to build a brand so that I can be supportive of them, but also stand on my own too. Mm -hmm. So when Justin went through his dark time, I built that up even more because when he came back, I wanted to be able to make a phone call on his behalf and people answer my call regardless of how they felt about him because they respected me. Mm -hmm. So I'd be able to help him the way he helped me. Mm. I think we live in a new day and age. I mean, I'm seeing the next generation has watched me do it and they're doing it too. People can criticize all they want. What right. they can't, this is what I always tell my staff. Let them talk shit, but it never matters if you outwork them. Right. People can say whatever they want, but they can't say we don't work hard. That's they can't say we don't do the job. They can't say we don't show up and they can't say we don't deliver. Facts. Do you so, feel a sense of responsibility to reach out and respond to the angry fans? No, because <laughs> I don't think it's real. Listen, how many Instagram followers do you have? Like 9.2. Yep. And Ariana and Justin, over 100 million. <sighs> so let me put it this way. When you have over 100 million, when you have 9.2, let's round up to 10. Okay. 
What's 1% of that? It's 100,000. Okay. My point is if 10,000 people are yelling at you at the same time on Instagram, uh -huh. it will feel like the world is ending. It's not real. None of this is real. Because if it was real, my life would suck. But my life is awesome. <laughs> so I don't pay attention to it. Most people know you in the industry as with your contributions to music. But in reality, you just do so much more. You're in film, TV, you're in tech. Some people might say that you're at your peak, but I don't even think you've hit your peak yet. I think that there's still so much more that Scooter Braun at SVP is gonna do. The things that I'm proudest of in my life at this point, the things I wanna be known for mm -hmm. are the philanthropy. And you know, we have Shauna in our company who's amazing. Yes, who, love you Shauna. Know, Shauna's job, we make the money, she gives it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my brother, has Pencil of Promise. My wife's the founder of Fuck Cancer, and so I live with a superhero. But like her, the kids, and giving, those are the things that are the things I'm proudest of. Those are the things I remember when you talk about success. The shows that I was, a, like Ariana at Manchester, like helping with the Children's March or the Hurricane Relief, like those are the biggest shows for me, the things I'm proudest of, because when you get to a certain place, that's actually what matters. Mm -hmm. And I have a rule with all my clients, which you know, 50-50. 50% you should do privately for your soul, and 50% you need to do publicly regardless of the criticism mm -hmm. because somebody's watching and you might inspire them to do the same. I was going to ask you about doing things privately and what does that mean to you? It's just for me. It's for me, my wife. I think it's selfish, honestly. Like, I'm going to teach my kids to be selfish as hell because if you actually look at the definition of being selfish, if you're selfish, you're thinking of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're like feeding your own soul. Right. I promise you, and you should tell your kid this, there is nothing more gratifying for your own soul than helping someone. So if you're truly being selfish, you'll help people all the time. <laughs> I never even thought of it like it's true. that. It's true. Your happiest is probably when you're helping people. Of course. You're never brought to tears by, you know, making money. You're not like sitting around like, oh, we did that deal. I'm going to break down an emotion. Right. But I'm sure when you've met fans and you've helped them, yeah. you've cried your eyes out. Are you kidding me? Bald. That's the best feeling in the world. That's a selfish feeling. Mm -hmm. We just need to be honest with ourselves and be like, that's okay. If I'm going to be selfish about something, let's be selfish about something that matters. Well, you talked a little bit about vulnerability and um, how this is kind of a new story for you that you're not a new story, but something that you're able to share now. I thought I was vulnerable. I thought I was strong. I thought I was like one of these guys who's like, wear my heart on my sleeve. But what I did is I wore it in a narrative. Mm. I wore it with what I'm comfortable with mm. to look strong. And when my grandmother passed away, my wife had our second child, Levi, nine days later. My dad was struggling because now both his parents were gone. I'm the oldest of, of his kids. My wife is breastfeeding and has a two-year-old baby and a, a newborn. And I'm, I'm not having time with the joy of my new son to mourn the loss of my grandmother. Mm. And I'm telling everybody I'm good, but for the first nine days, I was being there for my dad. And now I have to be there with the joy of my child. And I didn't have time to just be sad and grieve. And suddenly I got into a really dark place. Mm. And it started getting darker because I was afraid to put that energy on my wife because she was breastfeeding and dealing with newborns. And I couldn't go to my family because they were all struggling. Um, and I wanted to be strong for them. And then I realized, wait a second, like, where is everybody? My grandmother died, they all checked on me, and then they all went back to their life. Was it more than just your grandmother passing, or was it also work and stress and also, I mean, it's like to be that, have a loss in your family, have a new chapter come into your life. And it's like the combination of all of that seems incredibly stressful. Well, my job, to be honest with you, is stressful all the time. There's always something going on, like some fire. I think I was upset because there's so many people that I've been there for those fires. And it was like, you good? But I realized like no one was checking on me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because they didn't care. It was because I had never been broken. Mm. Since I was a kid, I was always the one who fixed things. Mm. I was always the strong one. And no one knew to ask me if I was okay because they couldn't even fathom that I wouldn't be okay. Mm. And that made me go into a deep, even darker place because I'm like, these people don't know me. They don't care about me. And, and I started going darker and darker. And then um, I started fishing, kind of throwing out text messages to friends. What are you doing? What are you doing? They'd be like, I'm good. How are you? Go move on. And my friend Ryan, um, he actually hit me back and said, do you want to go for a drink? And I was like, yeah. 
And I left and I went for a drink and we went to a comedy club and he didn't ask me one thing. We just hung out. And the next day he called me in the morning and goes, what's really going on? Wow. And he let me kind of breathe. And um, we talked and he said, have you talked to Yale? And I said, I can't, the baby. And he got me to talk to our friend Judah. Now I'm a practicing Jew. And <laughs> Judah is a well-known Christian pastor. Mm -hmm. But we're really, really close friends. And he said, Judah has to be the rock for so many in his community, everything else. He's been there. You should talk to him. And funny enough, I reach out to Judah, who's a close friend of mine. And Judah takes like three days to kind of get back to me in a manner that we can have this conversation because Judah can't fathom that I'm not okay. He thinks I'm the rock that I've always been. And finally gets on the phone. I said, Judah, this is what I want to talk to you about. And he was in shock. And he apologized for taking so long. He couldn't believe it. He's like, this is, you know, you got to tell your wife. Mm -hmm. And he convinces me to tell Yale. Um, I go back to her and I explain. And she sits me down and says, I love you. You never have to hide anything from me. We're partners. I'm here for you. And all the things I was expecting, I was like, all right, here are the hugs. Like, here we go. And then she looked at me and goes, but it's your fault. <laughs> for not standing up and saying anything? Not even, even deeper than that. I, what do you mean it's my fault? Like, you're supposed to be here to console me. And I didn't marry that kind of woman. I married a woman who's going to call me on my shit. Yep. And she said, how can you expect people to be there for you if they don't know who you are? Mm. And I said, what are you talking about? All these people, I've been there for them. Like, well, how can you say that? Mm. And she's like, no, 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 you've been there for them. And then you leave for the next one and the next one and the next one. You never stay to let people see who you are. Mm. How can they know you can break if you never even tell them that you're able of breaking? She was right. And I started to think about that. I made a New Year's resolution to myself that I would start having longer, deeper conversations with people, not running to the next fire mm. and letting people see who I am. And I started to make better relationships with people. I started to improve the relationships I had. Mm -hmm. And I got out of my depression finally because when I started to share, it was remarkable the amount of people that started showing up. You know, I speak at colleges, something like, and they'd come up to me and they'd say, listen, the fact that you say at where you are in your life, there's still nights you roll over and cry yourself to sleep and only your wife see because you're scared of maintaining all of this. Can't tell you the comfort I feel because I'm lost right now. And that's the thing. Life isn't this and suddenly you reach some plateau and you're fine. Life right. is this always. It, whatever your normal is, you're going to have the ups and the downs. Right. And she taught me that that is okay as long as I have the strength to tell people it's okay not to be okay. It changed everything for me. And that made me a happier person. Then uh, our daughter was born on December 1st this past year. And I wrote five letters to people I had problems with. Wow. I was on some kumbaya. I don't know what was going yeah. on. Yeah. And I wrote five letters because that was the second phase of stuff. It was talking about vulnerability. I was doing kind of work on myself and trying to figure out. And trust me, my wife will tell you I got a lot more work to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we um, all do. We're all ever evolving. Beyond. But I wrote these five letters and... I started off every letter. Now, you got to understand, these people I wrote these letters to, in my mind, before I sat down to write, they were wrong. And I wrote five letters, and I said, for whatever role I played in this, I'm sorry. Mm. And let's sit down. And I didn't care if they made up with me. It was just getting that out. Because I realized all I can control is myself and my own accountability. I can't control someone else's accountability. And some I made up, boom, boom, boom. Some it's a work in progress but I'm good. I hold no ill will towards anyone anymore, mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. because I know my truth. And if they want to have a conversation with me and they want to know what things are really about, if they want to take the time, I'm happy to do it. And I know we'll get to a good place. And if they don't, I can't control that. Just for them to see that part of you will bring some sort of success out of any conversation. And I think that you telling this story and telling it worldwide is important because more people need to hear it. What are you going to want out of life every single day? Do you want validation or do you want growth? And I think you're a person who wants growth. And I think so many of us, for me, for so long, I walked around this world saying I want to growth, but I was looking for validation in mm. what I was doing. Mm. And the truth is, what's really hard is to look at yourself and say, there's no way I'm perfect, so stop looking for validation. Let's just look for growth. Mm -hmm. And you got to make some hard judgments on yourself and some really big admissions if you want real growth your vulnerability and your self-love and your never being afraid while still afraid gives a lot of people confidence to have growth. And I think that is why I got excited to work with you when you and Penny came <laughs> to the house that day. Because I think 
you don't give people validation. You give them growth and you give them that happiness and you give them that self-worth. And I think you are the definition of a role model. Wow. Well, thank you. But it's all about vulnerability. That's it. Be honest, be nice, be vulnerable, and you will get the best out of people in return. You don't even have to be good at math. <laughs> so the last thing that we do on Pretty Big Deal is we do a live boldly lightning round question, and I just need you to answer the question simply. I'm scared. Go. Okay. What's the last pretty penny you spent? Um, I bought my kids two Avengers, and I bought my daughter an Elsa doll. Oh, those are pretty pennies. But they have to give me a toy for kids who don't have toys every time I give them a toy. Oh my gosh, I love that idea. have to idea. do an exchange. Oh, Justin, I want to do that. That's a good idea. What's your biggest deal breaker? Trust. That's a big one. And finally, I only have pretty big deals on my podcast. So I want to know what's a pretty big deal to you? Family. Family, hands down. You can tell. Scooter, thank you so much for coming on. Best. Thank you for being an inspiration. Thank you for being open and honest. And I just appreciate you in my life. And I'm just, I'm so excited for more growth. I'm excited for you. More growth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to join the conversation on social. Follow us, Pretty Big Deal on Instagram and Twitter. And send us all your questions and comments. We want to hear from you. 